Hello and welcome to the Llama Podcast. I'm Peter Bowes and Llama Live Long and Master Aging is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. Today I'm in London at University College London, UCL, to meet Professor David Jems. David is a geneticist and assistant director of the Institute of Healthy Aging here. A biochemist and biogerontologist, David works with tiny worms called nematodes to try to shed some light on why ageing happens and how, if we consider ageing to be a disease, it can be stopped in its tracks. The mechanisms involved in the ageing process are similar in different organisms, from worms to mice to humans, and for many years now David has focused on trying to unravel the mysteries behind the process, this process of ageing that we all find so fascinating. David, it's great to meet you. How do you do? How did you become interested in ageing? Well, I remember when I was a graduate student at the Institute of Genetics in Glasgow, and I was eating lunch in the library, and there was a copy of Genetics, the journal Genetics, and I found a paper in it by a guy called Tom Johnson, who's at the University of uh, Colorado, and it was about a mutant worm with a, a, a mutation in a gene called age one and it was describing how these mutants were were long-lived and um, suggested that you could use genetics to understand the biology of aging and I remember reading it thinking god can you do biology of aging can you actually study aging as a process you know can you do genetics on aging and I thought my god if, if that were true that would that's an extraordinary question to to try to um to tackle and I, and i i started you know looking at the bibliography for the paper uh, it led me to a number of some of, of, of earlier papers about aging about the theories of aging and the evolutionary biology of aging and i guess at the time i was looking for some sort of big unanswered question you know that it, that it would be good to focus on something new and coming up and I thought my god this is a huge question and if it's possible to um, actually use something like C. elegans to investigate aging and C. elegans is so simple that's the nematode it, yeah the nematode you know it's so simple it must be possible to actually discover what aging is and has your yeah. understanding of what aging is perhaps the definition of aging changed since those early days oh yeah very much so and, and not just mine either i think the whole field has kind of transformed over the last uh, 20 years it's it's an incredible <laughs> it's an incredible field to work in. it's actually very unnerving because of the way that things that you thought were given turn out not to be given and i uh, it's it, it seems to get worse over time the more the more and more of the things which i took to be facts about aging turn out not to be what what comes to mind that's unnerving about what has perhaps changed in your mind in terms of what you thought was a fact but isn't so when i came into the field the main idea about aging was that it's caused by it that aging is a process like that which affects lots of complex systems like cars or buildings that they just deteriorate over time. So it's, it's, it's a sort of system failure, damage accumulation type of idea. That It's that sort of process. So this is one of these, what I actually think is uh, kind of a folk science idea about aging, something that comes from common sense and common experience, you know, like the idea that the, the sun obviously goes around the earth because that's what you see. And so the idea was that there is some sort of underlying process of damage accumulation which is, in a way, the primary cause of ageing. So there is a central underlying mechanism of ageing, something which is the cause of all ageing. Which is common to uh, which is most pr organisms. Probably common to most organisms, although, of course, we know there are some organisms that are, appear to be non-ageing, like uh, things like hydra, but most organisms. And so the processes that protect against ageing would be processes that protect against damage accumulation, so repair turnover so you can replace the damaged molecules damaged cells and um, detoxification of things that would cause damage like with antioxidants and so on so this was a this was a central central idea the idea that if you're studying aging you're studying a central underlying process which is linked to damage 
And that's an idea which has, I think, gradually developed problems over the last, especially over the last uh, 10, 15 years. And at the present stage, I, I, I really don't believe there is a, a kind of underlying aging process in that sense, in that simple sense. The reality is something more complex and nuanced. I mean, there is something to study, but it's not, it's not what we thought. What happened in the aging field and what I think has driven it in terms of underlying paradigms that have also inspired people is the combination of the discovery of interventions that slow aging down or they appear to do so. They extend lifespan and they suppress uh, aging-related diseases. They delay them. Not so they don't actually block them. So you get long-lived laboratory organisms, m- mice, rats, fruit flies, nematode worms, yeast. So there was this observation, uh, combined with this notion of aging as something caused by damage, which both of which supported this idea that there's a central underlying aging process. So when you say damage, oxidative stress, that kind of thing? Yes, yes. For example, I think there's a whole fa- there's really a whole family of different... I mean, there are many theories of aging, and you can kind of group them into, into classes. And there's a, there are many different theories that in one way or another refer in some way to the notion of damage accumulation and things wearing out and things kind of going wrong, you know, in, in, in this sort of system failure way. Well, I'd like to talk in some detail about your work and maybe first of all understand a little bit more about where you came from and how you got to this point in your career. You trained as a biochemist initially. Yes, I did a BSc in biochemistry at at Sussex University uh, in the early 80s and then I kind of quit science. I was disillusioned. It was when Margaret Thatcher became prime minister. I found it so uh, horrible living in Britain at the time. I I decided to leave the country and I, I felt... I guess I lost my com- I lost confidence that the way that society was that science was really going to work in the interests of people. Really, you know, it just seemed to be business and corporations. Do you see some um, parallels with current politics, perhaps? Oh on the yes, side of the yes, it, it, yes. In, in some ways, yes. In some ways, it's it reminds me of those times. Here in Britain, it's it's not nearly as bad, of course, but um, in some ways, broadly, it's much more ominous. What's happening? It's rather as if we're in this sort of, maybe not so much the 30s, but the late 20s. So when you left Britain, where did you go? I went initially to Mexico. I had a plan to teach English in Mexico, to learn Spanish, and then to move to... Where I particularly wanted to go at the time was to Nicaragua, which had just had a revolution. So it seemed as if here was a place where they were trying to make a have a different kind of society. I did end up in Nicaragua, although I didn't end up didn't spend that much time there in the end. I spent ended up spending more time in Costa Rica, uh, doing various different jobs. And then I moved to um, up to the U.S. A, f- a friend of mine got me a job working on a building site in the high deserts outside of Los Angeles, and I, I was there for about nine months, I suppose. And then I moved back to Britain, and I, I had an idea about whereabouts in the high desert. Uh, it was a place. Um, it, it was near to uh, Palmdale which is um, not far from Edwards Air Force Base. For a while I wanted to work in film. I was trying to work in sort of zero-budget documentaries and so on. And I just um, started thinking about going back into science, just as out of a loop, being at a loose end, really. So I ended up taking a PhD position in just as a sort of a experiment, really, see how it would, how, what that would be like. And it was wonderful. I loved it. It was so different to being an undergraduate doing research. And I couldn't, I've been trying to work on things on my own, you know, and suddenly having the whole structure of the institute all around me and the technicians and the bottle washers and everything all there to support me. It was like a, gosh, it was wonderful. Is that when you discovered nematode worms? Well, I was working originally, uh, because my background's in genetics, and I was really initially interested in developmental genetics. And I was working on Aspergillus, a fungus, mainly because of I was interested in the question of what is morphogenesis? How do genes control morphogenesis? Which is still a very, it's an area which remains very poorly understood. How is 3D shape actually specified by genes? You know, if you had an identical twin, it'd have the exact same nose. How is that specified? And uh, aging, as it turns out, is something a little, a little similar, where you can do some genetics, but the trait itself, the aging trait, is very mysterious how genes actually specify it. 
so yes, it was there that I kind of realized that I really enjoyed doing research. So I thought I'd try and do it as long as I could. I, I never thought I'd end up running a lab or anything, you know. But um, I thought I'd try and make it last. And then um, I decided, well, if I'm going to keep doing this, I, I need a really good question, something really revolutionary and so that you could spend a life working on. And I thought, gosh, if one could actually figure out what ageing was, that would be really tremendous. It would be the good that one could do with that. Aging is now the main cause of disease in the world, and it's not understood as a biological process. Which sure. is difficult for some people to get their head around, that aging almost in itself is the disease that leads to conditions that would eventually kill us. I think the way that aging is conceptualised, even among scientists, but more broadly by, you know, by the general public and by, particularly through it by doctors, is quite confused. And there are various reasons for that, I think. I mean, one of the reasons that one of the things which is confusing is simply the word aging is the word aging is very confusing because it has multiple meanings, which are quite different. So, I mean, aging can refer to, for example, the, simply the passage of calendar time. Uh, which is undisputable that yeah. the, the years pass by and we are at a certain age. That's true, that word. But, that, but it can simply refer, if you say to someone's aging, it can just simply mean that they are older in years with no judgment about what's happening to them in any way. Age changes. And then you have, aging can refer to any sort of change that happens with advancing age, positive, negative, neutral, even in objects. You know, they age, they change with age. And the, and the you, car is often a good analogy there, isn't it? Because cars age, cars rust, cars fall apart. Well, but that, there is another meaning of aging, which is the deteriorative changes that happen with advancing age. And biologists call that senescence. They refer to it as senescence. So uh, when I'm talking about aging, I'm generally talking about senescence. But aging can also refer to uh, maturational changes that happen during adulthood, which can be positive. You know, you talk about wines aging. You know, you're talking about them maturing. So when people, uh, you know, if Julie Walters says, you know, I, I'm embracing aging, I mean, she's presumably not embracing senescence. But it creates a lot of confusion, what, 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 what that means. In and and senescence is when cells stop having the ability to duplicate. No, no, no. This is a, a big confusion created by Len Hayflick. So senescence originally was introduced as a term to describe the deteriorative changes that happen with increasing age, including increased mortality rate. Len Hayflick was studying the capacity of cells in vitro to divide and how that changes over time. And he found that there's a limited proliferative capacity for cultured cells. And rather polemically, he called that cellular senescence. And that was because it had long been claimed that cells in culture, were, that, that they were able to proliferate indefinitely. And so that aging was not a function of proliferative exhaustion of any kind. This was an idea that a bit was around for about 50 years. So he was really being polemical. He was saying, OK, look, we've shown that cells have a limited proliferative capacity. This is cellular senescence. Maybe this is what's causing organismal aging. But now we have two meanings of the word senescence. So again, we have this polysemy problem, you know, which is causing confusion. Because now in, among the younger researchers, sometimes they see papers referring to senescence. So they think you talk about cellular senescence, which is a very specific phenomenon uh, identified by Hayflick. No, I'm talking about the deteriorative aspect of, of aging overall. I mean, if you look at, as a biologist at aging, if I look at aging in, in C. elegans, the way that aging manifests is as a set of pathological changes, as a set of diseases, really. And I think in a way, a, a sort of rational way of looking at aging, or senescence, is, it is simply a collection of pathologies. I mean, that's, what, that's implicit in the word senescence. These are deteriorative changes. These are pathological changes. So, um, so senescence is, you could call it a, a disease, but I think more accurate would be uh, to call it um, a disease syndrome. Or even more accurately, I think more precisely, it is probably a collection of disease syndromes and, uh, if you like, unitary diseases, so sort of single cause diseases. It's a whole collection of different deteriorative changes. I think there's no one underlying mechanism of ageing. Why is the elegans, the nematode worm, such a good model to work with? Well, it's a standard approach for 
if you like, reductionist biology, if you have a complex problem to solve, a, a difficult question to answer, like, you know, how do genes work? You don't start working on human cells. You start working on the simplest kinds of organisms that have, have genes, which in the early days, those were bacteriophages, bacterial viruses and, and their effects on, on bacteria. So, um, you know, gene function was worked out using bacteriophages. So if you want to try to identify fundamental mechanisms of aging, a good approach is just to take the simplest kind of animal that exhibits aging in a way that's, you know, looks plausibly the same sort of processes in higher animals and study that. So if we can um, take a creature like C. elegans, which has a lifespan of only two to three weeks, and yet it is an animal. It's an animal that, you know, it has embryogenesis, it has a nervous system, it has a digestive system, it has a reproductive system, you know, it has behavior, learning even. And you can understand what aging is in that organism. And this is an organism that, that's about a millimeter in length. Yes, yes. So you can treat it, you can use microbiology techniques. And this was the, the Sidney Brenner's original idea who, who really began work with C. elegans as a model for doing genetics. And he'd worked previously with bacteriophages, but he wanted to move to a new question, which was particularly, I think, what interested him. What interested him was the, the nature of the brain and the mind and the nervous system. He wanted to be able to do genetics on the nervous system conveniently. So he thought, let's have a really simple organism for doing that, the simplest organism that has a complex nervous system. That's really the beauty of it. Uh, it's very cheap to work with, very convenient. And when I started, I referred to the fact that the mechanism does, and we've, you've mentioned it too, the mechanism does seem to be similar, whether you're talking about a, a nematode worm or a fruit fly or a mouse or indeed human beings. How similar? And I suppose what I'm getting at and what people always want to know is, can you really extrapolate from what's happening in a tiny one millimeter worm to potentially what could be happening in you and I. Yeah. One of the starting points for the work on aging in model organisms like yeast and C. elegans and Drosophila is the fact that different animal species have very, very different lifespans. So for example, our lifespan as human beings is something like double that of our closest relative, the chimpanzee, which is a very, very closely related species to our own. So lifespan and aging rate is very much a function of our genomes. So the, the major thrust of the work with the model organisms is about the genetics of, of aging, to try to discover the genes that actually control lifespan, and then to discover what those genes encode, and then thereby that's a way to lead us to the processes of aging itself. So looking at comparing the different animal models like fruit flies and C. elegans with humans. Um, I mean, first of all, the genomes, there are many genes which are effectively the same. The basic genetic toolkit to make a C. elegans is very similar to that of a human being. Initially, it was really unclear whether one would really discover fundamental mechanisms of human aging from looking at a worm, because we have no idea what aging is. Aging could be completely different in a worm to a human being. At the outset, we had no idea. So one of the things that made people very optimistic in terms of there being universal underlying mechanisms of aging was the discovery of various uh, genetic pathways which exist in, in worms, in fruit flies, and in humans, which control aging. So, for example, there's a pathway called the insulin IGF signaling pathway and another related pathway called the TOR pathway, which influence aging in, in C. elegans, in fruit flies, in mice, and there's evidence uh, that they may also do so in humans. So there are, there's some sort of genetic regu regulation of aging, which seems to be quite universal. I mean, my own work recently has been very much focusing on the question of, okay, here are genes that control aging, but what is aging? I mean, that's really... I think where the biggest question is, you know, what exactly is aging? What, how, how, how do we understand it? And I think there are really fundamental questions there which are unanswered and require profound changes in the way we look at aging to be able to actually get a proper understanding. So here it, it, it's more complex. I think that um, 
So this is about the mechanisms of aging itself. The one, th- so we ha- I, I criticised the damage theory. So the question is, if, it, if it's not damaged, what is it? The theory which has been around for a long time, which has remained in the main unchallenged in, in its central claims, is about aging is the evolutionary theory. And there are various versions of the theory, but the, the, the version which is arguably the most useful, it argues that genes are often very pleiotropic, so they have many different effects on an organism in different parts of the body and, and in different times in the life history. If you have a situation where, let's say, a new gene variant is promoting fitness in early life, it's improving reproductive success, but that same variant actually also promotes pathology in later life, that variant may overall be favoured by selection because of its effects on early life. So the point is, is that genes effects on early life are are what count when it comes to evolutionary fitness. If they have deleterious effects later, it doesn't matter. And the reasons for that are complex, partly to do with extrinsic causes of mortality, but there's a lot more to it than that. But what this theory is saying about mechanisms of aging is very fundamentally, it's pointing to the cause of aging, which is our own genome. So aging, in a sense, is programmed by our genes. That is to say that genes, our own wild-type genes, not genes that are mutant, so it's not a genetic disease in the sense of something like cystic fibrosis, where you have a a disease that's not caused by the wild-type gene, the normal gene. It's actually, these are diseases that are caused by the wild-type. So in a sense, it's a type of genetic disease, but different to the ones that medical, people in medical genetics generally recognize. What remains unclear, or has you know, in a way, has, is kind of where the frontier of knowledge is, in a way, I think, is, is how do those genes actually produce pathology? How, what are those genes actually, what's the nature of the pathologies that, that these genes are generating? And that's very much what my own work is looking at at, at, at the moment. So, so aging is, I think there are multiple things that cause aging. For example, you know, something like dental plaque accumulates in your, on your teeth and contributes to the deterioration of your teeth. This is something that contributes to aging, which is not caused by your own genes. But, you know, there are multiple things that contribute to aging, but I think what I think the biology is telling us is that the primary cause is our own genome. So it's programmed by our genes, but it's not programmed in the sense of having a purpose. So the, the, the genes are not doing this because it, in some way it's beneficial to us. It's simply a byproduct, a, a kind of an unadvantageous byproduct of good things that the genes are doing in early life. So it's a, it's a meaningless process. It is very, very much a disease, I think. Well, um, one thing, you, you mentioned the insulin IGF pathway, and th- this is an area that I've looked into s- to some extent with uh, Dr. Walter Longo in Los yeah. Angeles, and uh, people with a mutation that blocks the IGF receptor, and they have Laron syndrome. The Ecuadorian dwarfs. The Ecuadorian yeah, dwarfs. Yeah. They're, they're very short, uh, and they have very low levels of, of IGF-1. And they don't, and there's relatively few in terms of numbers of, of these people around the world, but studies so far suggest they don't get cancer. Maybe perhaps one lady in Ecuador has, has developed cancer. Uh, heart disease, essentially the killer diseases of old age, and they reach a reasonable age and then usually die of of something else. It, it's an interesting insight, isn't it, into the, the the bigger picture that you're talking about? Yes, they're very interesting. Those folks, you know, they're also they they tend to um, be rather overweight, which generally is a risk factor for things like type two diabetes and heart disease and so on. But they seem not to be affected. Um, it's subcutaneous fat as opposed to, to fatty liver. Yeah, it's it's yeah, all on the outside. Yeah, yeah. And, and the th- ongoing science, but the theory is that that is part of uh, of the effect of actually having perhaps the, the low levels of IGF-1, that it causes this uh, extra fat uh, yes. at a subcutaneous level. So I, I think that um, you know one can make a strong case that these the insulin IGF pathway, TOR pathway, are really promoting aging. So this is our wild-type genes promoting aging right across the animal kingdom. And the question I think that is, is really interesting and that one can address in C. elegans is, you know, what exactly does that mean? What exactly does it mean that there's an underlying aging process that is kind of the cause of all aging? Is this mechanism, are the mechanisms the same in C. elegans and in a human being? So 
the work that I'm doing here, I, we have a, there's a new theory, a recent theory, which um, is an alternative to the damage maintenance kind of paradigm that's dominated by gerontology for years, which is based on partly on this uh, trade-off model that I talked about, the evolutionary theory, but also based on a lot of the recent observations within the field. So the big question about aging, I think, in terms of, you know, creating a big picture, like a, an understanding of aging, is to combine the evolutionary theory, which seems to provide a convincing explanation in kind of ultimate terms, with a description of proximate mechanisms, actual mechanisms, you know, what actually happens in organisms to cause them to die. And there was one theory that tried to do that, which I think was, a, I thought, a very beautiful theory, which was proposed by uh, someone called Tom Kirkwood, who, who until recently was at the University of Newcastle. So what he argued was, OK, the trade-off theory is correct. Aging is caused by damage. So maybe the issue is that maintenance to protect against aging, to prevent damage from accumulating, is costly in energy terms, in resource terms. In the wild, you have, you're often, organisms are, li are living with limited resource availability. And they have to choose between investing the, the, the scarce resources they have into reproduction or into those expensive and costly maintenance processes. So what they will do is to, is to invest just enough resource into maintenance to be able to live long enough to be able to reproduce, but no more. Because if they, if they invest enough to make themselves non-aging, they're going to reduce their reproductive output and they're going to be at a selective disadvantage. So they, what results is what um, Kurt would call a disposable soma. So th to me, this was always the kind of theory that one wanted to explain aging, the evolutionary and the mechanistic all in one big picture. The problem is, I think that it's not, the evidence is not compelling that damage accumulation causes aging. I mean, damage accumulation clearly contributes to aging, Damage appears in high levels in very old organisms, but it's not clear whether that's as a consequence of pathologies that have arisen from other causes. You know? Whenever you have a major pathology like a broken leg or a you know, major infection, you have lots of molecular damage. It's a, sort of, it's a symptom of severe loss of homeostasis. So uh, the, the new theory was put forward by a Russian guy called Mikhail Blagoslony, who's based at... Um, place called the Roslin Institute in, in um, Buffalo in New York State in America. And what he argued was that actually rather than senescent pathologies arising mainly from damage, that they, would, they were resulting gene action from actual late life gene action. So rather than things breaking down, uh, it was more that wild type functions were, were activated inappropriately. You know? Or sometimes they just simply con continued when they should s ideally stop for optimizing viability. And this is um, this theory, uh, sometimes called the hyperfunction theory. So the idea is that rather than function breaking down because of a loss of function, aging is caused more by too much function, hence hyperfunction. And he argues that um, he calls the processes that give rise to late life pathologies in this scenario quasi-programs, insofar as they are programs, they are biological processes that are programmed by genes that serve a function in early life, but in later life, their continuation uh, is not contributing to fitness, and in fact, it's contributing to pathology. So um, in C. elegans, for example, a, a very neat example of a, of a quasi-program is um, the worms, uh, they uh, make a lot of yolk for their eggs, so they lay a lot of eggs. But at a certain point, they, they can't produce any more eggs. But the mechanism of yolk production is not switched off. It simply continues. And as a consequence, the worms fill up with huge quantities of oily yolk pools, which then spread into their tissues. So here you have a pathology, a senescent pathology, and you have an explanation for where this pathology has originated from. It hasn't originated because of anything breaking down. Everything's fine. You know, they're doing the cells are doing their job. They're producing yolk. It's just not switched off. It's a very simple example of a quasi program. So the program is is the program that produces yolk, but once reproduction has ended, it changes from a program into a quasi program, which is pathogenic. An exa example of quasi program in, in in human aging could be, for example, um, in the development of osteoporosis. Uh, 
you have uh, excess activity of osteoclasts that cause bone resorption that will that carries on senselessly so this activity of the osteoclasts is actually driving the uh, atrophy of bone or uh, inflammation is is a, is also a good example of a quasi program there are a lot of ways in later life that inflammation which in early life is involved in in tissue repair actually becomes turned on chronically and is uh, is driving a number of different senescent pathologies uh, not to mention cancer you know i mean cancer is you know cancers are not a problem because they they fail and break down and are deteriorating it's because they're too vigorous cancer is a very much a disease of, of hyperfunction although of course it requires DNA damage to actually generate it in the first place. So what you're saying uh, and to paraphrase a lot of this is there's a kind of evolutionary inevitability about ageing. The conditions that under which most organisms evolve also lead to the evolution of ageing the inevitability issue is relates more I think to the fact that ageing is programmed by our genes but what's interesting, I think, about in terms of thinking about therapies and also thinking about the Blagosconi theory is that um, the implication is that if you can allow the programs to be expressed but then switch off the quasi-programs, yeah, if you can stop the quasi-programs from developing, that's a way to intervene in, in ageing. And I think that's, I think, very likely what, what is happening in a lot of these long-lived mo- animal models, like in C. elegans, if you if you knock down insulin IGF signaling, you can double and triple, and in fact, in, in one case, you can increase up to tenfold the adult lifespan. What the Blagoscoloni model predicts is that what's happening here is that is that insulin IGF signaling is essentially it's uh, a requirement for the development of pathology. So, in a way, this is kind of shifting attention away from. The, it's shifting the focus away from biochemical type models of aging because the, the damage theory has tended to f- emphasize the importance of the biochemical, the molecular damage, free radicals, you know, and so on, metabolism, generating free radicals and so on. And it suggests instead a view of aging which is in a way more developmental, more like a developmental process. You could think of pathologies as entities that, that have a, a developmental biology that you can understand. And so what's happening in the long-lived mutants is that by blocking insulin nitro signaling and TOR signaling, essentially you're blocking the development of these programs because these pathways are fundamentally required for, for all growth. If you knock out insulin nitro signaling, for example, in C. elegans completely, you simply block embryonic development. There's so, no development at all. So with our understanding of, of these pathways uh, and what happens if you block insulin IGF, for example, how can we apply that knowledge? Is there a way that we can apply that knowledge to the way that we live to yes. affect our longevity? No, absolutely. I think that um, in that sense, there are a number of fundamental implications of the Blagosconi theory and the, the insulin IGF signaling story together. I think the first implication is that these types of intervention in animal models are probably not touching the fundamental aging process. They are probably touching on genetically specified um, syndromes of polymorbidity. So, in other words, if you were to intervene in insulin and nitrous signaling and prevent the development of these pathologies, you'd probably end up then dying of some other cause internally generated, right? So this is not the whole aging process that these programs are are controlling. They're controlling a whole range of senescent pathologies which contribute to late life mortality and which limit life. So if you inhibit them, you're not going to live forever. You're going to live longer and healthier lives, but then you're going to die in the end still from senescent pathology, probably caused by something else. Living longer and healthier is still probably the goal for most of us as opposed think, to living forever i think fundamentally if you're trying if you try to sort of measure how great a medical intervention is a simple way of looking at it is how many years of healthy life does it add and at the moment the way that medicine the medical establishment deals with late life health is trying to repair problems once they've arisen at the level of individual pathologies you know i think about my my poor mum, you know, she, she died a few years ago. She had a very bad cardiovascular trouble and, and very nearly died. 
and the NHS were fantastic. They they managed to bring her back from the brink, and to sort of adjust her meds and everything like that. And she was, she she came back. She was alive again. But then a few years later, she she had developed breast cancer and dementia. So you know this is how it is. You, you take away one disease, and you just immediately more even more will come back and take its place. If you can treat causes of polymorbidity in late life, which I think is what's happening with these long-lived insulin and nitrous signaling mutants, you have the prospect of kind of taking out a whole range of different diseases of aging. You know, and the benefits of that, I think, in terms of being able to really produce profound improvements in late life health are very great. So what, in terms of interventions, what the Blagosloni theory and the, and the animal model stuff is saying is that you can intervene and inhibit these quasi-programs. So what this is saying is that you, you want interventions that you can apply in really in midlife before the pathologies have developed. So once the pathologies appear, once you get breast cancer or you get dementia, it's extremely difficult to deal with that. But if you, what you can do is you can st- stop it from developing in the first place, or at least you can decelerate the pathology. That's what many of these interventions are doing they're essentially decelerating the aging process so i think that's where this is what this is pointing to not people living forever and i think in terms of the magnitude of the effects in humans i must say i'm not particularly optimistic in you know well i wouldn't expect let's say treatments that are going to double lifespan or anything like that i think we're probably looking over the next centuries in terms of adding a decade and then another decade and another decade over long periods of time based on what we know now. But that's still a huge gain. If you were to, it's been calculated, if you were to completely eliminate all cancer, the effect on lifespan would be really quite small because people would just die instead from cardiovascular disease. Three or four years, Yeah, maybe. Yeah, exactly. So I think, um, I suspect that through these types of intervention, I think the prospects for, for greater gains are there. You were involved recently in a study involving flies and sugar and lifespan. Do you want to tell me about that? Yeah, this was mainly uh, work from uh, actually the fellow two doors down, which is Dr. Nazif Alic. Uh, that study was really looking at the, uh, the effects of exposure to sugar in early life and what that, how that affected life later. I suppose the implications are that it's possible to, that for organisms to uh, be metabolically altered by high sugar in such a way that it's really long-lasting. I think it's a uh, to me, the main impact of that study was that uh, it's just a warning about high sugar in our diet, and particularly the danger of and the children the f- having high sugar in their diet. You the, know? the flies fed a high sugar diet had significantly shorter lives. Shorter lives, even though they had relatively brief exposure in, in early life. I remember actually with the, with the press release for that, I was trying to convince Nazif that he should link it to the uh, plans to actually tax sugar to try to t- and tax sugary drinks for children and this sort of thing you know i'm afraid that uh, our government may not be responsible may consider business interests more important than the, than the interests of um, protecting children against uh, long-term dangers of exposure to high levels I mean, I think, of sugar. I think you described as, as, as shocking the, the fact that this study illustrated the, the mechanism at work yeah, yeah. so blatantly. Yeah, no, it's a big health danger. I mean, I think you know, what's so tragic at the moment is that, you know, that lifespans around the world, especially in the developed world, are still going up. And yet you have at the same time this epidemic of, of obesity which is something that tends to have a higher impact on people of a lower socioeconomic status, and particularly immigrants, tend to be more vulnerable, immigrant children. So you have um, sort of emerging pattern of inequality where you have at the lower end people's life expectancy is getting shorter and at the top, at upper end people's life expectancy is getting longer. You know, how awful that is. And looking at the state of global migration at the moment, that must be... a a big concern. Yes. How do you apply what you understand about aging, whether it's sugar, the mechanisms at work, to your own life and, and your own longevity? What, what's your attitude towards that? Well, I, I have a bad conscience about this whole subject. I, I think, um, I don't know, my wife complains, you know, that, that I don't take enough care 
to sort of promote my career and, and, and this sort of thing. You know, she's always wants me to try and get a raise, you know, and, and promote myself, you know. And in a similar way, I, I think with working on, on the biology of aging, I, I, I think to me it, it's enormously rewarding to think about the enormous benefit that can come from this work. You know, it's something for humanity, you know, something to make a better world. Maybe I'm just sort of grown up with a mindset of somebody who, who thinks a good life is to sort of sacrifice yourself for the good of others, you know. Because I never really think about it for my own, <laughs> myself, you know. And I, I, occasionally, from time to time, I think, gosh, I, I ought to think about this for myself. And a few times I get a bunch of stuff to read and think, okay, I'll read into whether I should be taking metformin. Should I be taking? Should I be taking the poly pill? You know, the cardiovascular poly pill. Well, a number a number of researchers in your position or you know, globally involved in science at a high level that that are taking metformin. Yeah. There's no real evidence uh, long term yet in humans that it is going to help your longevity. This is the diabetes drug that we're talking about. Yet some people yeah. are putting their no, I, in that direction. I know people who take rapamycin. I mean, I think that I, the fact that I don't is is um, really that I don't take any of these drugs is simply a matter of neglect of my own interests, really. I th- you know, I, I think I'm very, very focused on trying to solve the problems that I'm working on. I mean, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to say that I'm saintly or anything. It's just it's just my, my mentality. I think I think the work... Working on this just keeps me going from day to day, you know, and I'm very grateful. You know, what, you know, I think the work itself, working as a scientist, I'm sure is good for my health. I'm sure it's good for my mental health, you know. What about uh, your diet, your um, exercise? I mean, I, uh, just, just commonsensical stuff. I mean, I about 20 years ago, I quit smoking, you know. I'm quite, quite like scotch whiskey, you know. But I tend to usually, I tend to, my habit is often probably three or four days a week when I go home from work no, on the weekend not I'll have a I'll have a have a one scotch you know single malt scotch it's been documented that moderate alcohol consumption can improve health I can really see in my own case I'm, I'm sure that's doing me good you know I, th- I think I I get health through my marriage you know I, I'm very uh, diligent husband and loyal husband and I think you know uh, I get the good, good stuff back from that a lot. Cycling, I think, definitely is is keeps me going. I'm, I'm conscious that 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 the exercise. I plan my life in such a way that I always have a distance to work, which is a cyclable distance. And that, I suppose that's that's a conscious thing to keep my health going. I mean, you know, these are you don't have to be a scientist to figure this stuff out. Do you eat? I wear sunblock. That's probably the only anti aging thing that I do. I wear sunblock because I think that's an anti aging treatment that is that it will work because uh, sun damage does cause skin aging. So why not do that? Um, but um, also um, I have red, cancer. I have reddish hair. So I've, I already had a couple of minor cancers taken off my forehead from when I worked out in the desert, actually in the high desert. I've got a lot of sunburn out there. So it's partly because of that. But if that is, I, I would say that that's probably the only thing where I consciously think that's an anti-aging treatment is to, is to use sunblock. And how's your diet? Com- completely nothing, nothing. I don't do anything special. Is yeah, nothing just, you avoid? You don't avoid red no, meat or nothing at all. Right? Sugar. Uh, I tend not to. I tend not to eat a lot of meat just out of preference. Oh, I have a. I have a peculiarity in my eating, but it's more of a neurotic problem, which is that I generally can't eat before about eleven in the morning. But I think it's just I just have a slightly melancholic temperament, so I think I just have no appetite in the morning since I was a little boy. And what time is your um, last meal of the day? Well, I normally eat with the kids. I usually, I usually cook dinner for my kids at around eight in the evening. So, oh, actually, my train of thought there is there's almost a, uh, without thinking about it, an intermittent fasting regime going on there. At least, uh, what maybe fourteen hours, sixteen hours well, between I, meals. I've noticed that. Um, I noticed uh, when I was um, really, I noticed it in my early twenties when I got more and more fanatical about reading and trying to understand you know philosophy and things like this and kind of really coming up against my own inadequacy intellectual inadequacies you know I discovered that there were things that I couldn't understand but if I tried to understand them in the first three hours after I woke up in the morning then I I could actually figure them out 
and I think that was that may be in some way linked to not eating in the morning. None of this is uh, deliberate. As I say, the only deliberate thing is uh, is sunblock. I would say. I mean, cycling. I've just uh, I just discovered from the age of about thirty five that, that if I cycled. I didn't have problems with stamina at work, sort of in the middle of the afternoon, you know. Yeah. I'd sometimes feel really tired in the early afternoon, you know. Just going back to the, the sort of more agile mind first thing in the morning in a starved state, uh, I, it may not be fully understood, but there's a lot of anecdotal evidence there. And when people talk about going into ketosis, which you're probably not into after just 16 hours, but you're, you're heading in that direction. It does create this greater awareness. You've brain seems yeah. to be ticking over a little bit faster yeah i think it's also uh i mean i think it's uh it's probably linked to melancholia you know so so famously uh, melancholic people uh, are sort of renowned to, to be wise and thoughtful uh, i just saw uh, julius caesar at the rsc in stratford on avon with my kids i was reading about the the depiction of cassius as a melancholic you know and, and it, he was a sort of representation of a of a, of a sort of wise melancholic individual, you know, uh, melancholia often has a has a daily cycle, where uh, one tends to be more melancholic in the morning. Hence the blues. I woke up this morning, you know, but with the melancholia comes the sharpness of concentration. So it's, I think it's probably psychopathology rather than anything dietary, really. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned you enjoy a glass of scotch. I've got to ask you about red wine and oh, yeah. this Veratrol. That, you know, yeah. A decade ago, people thought that that was the, the great answer to yeah. living yeah, long. Yeah. And then it proved not to be. And, and you actually did a lot of work on was the, the proving of it not to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the resveratrol story has multiple aspects. I mean, I think you know, it was the, the, the resveratrol story uh, arose from work on a, a class of um, proteins called sirtuins, it's histone deacetylases, which have turned out to be very interesting and important and, and to have you know, all sorts of effects on health and many, many biological processes that sort of s- fundamentally involved in gene regulation and so on. The particular claim I think that was has been problematic is the claim that sirtuins mediate the effects of diet restriction on lifespan. And I think that hasn't stood up well at all. So the idea was that if you could have a, if you could identify the the pathways that mediated the effects of diet restriction on health, then you could have a drug that would mimic diet restriction by acting on that pathway. So, that, so it's a very good idea in principle. In fact, some of the current work on metformin is, I think, very much thinking along the same lines. I interviewed uh, uh, Nia Barzilai oh, yeah, uh, yeah. a few weeks oh, ago. We, we talked about this subject. He's totally great. And I, it's so exciting what, what he's doing with, with the, this metformin trial. Yeah. I hope it works. I'm, I'm not sure that it will. I'm slightly worried that it will. I, I won't. I think the, the trial that I think will work, I, I think very likely will work, is the, um, is the DOG project, which is based at the University of Washington. That, that's headed by uh, Matt Caberline and, and um, Daniel Promislow. That's a project which is it's almost kind of stacking the deck for a success because it's looking at, at uh, animals which, where their lifespan is very likely to be substantially shortened because of an excess of tor signaling, which are these large short-lived dogs like Great Danes and so on. This is a, essentially a, a collaborative project with dog owners to feed rapamycin, or I'm not sure if it's rapamycin or a, a, a drug that has a similar pharmacology. Yeah, so dog, dog lifespan is fascinating. A very interesting. Different yeah. size dogs, yeah. and different I've, lifestyle dogs. This is very much, I think, to do, this is very much linked to the incidentized sigling story. So it's it's the pathways that control growth are also promoting pathology. Because if the, thing, the, thing is, the thing that's so unexpected about this work, and I think that baffles people uh, in the medical side, you know, is that it was always considered that all these diseases of aging are separate and they must have different etiologies. And what's so unexpected is that these treatments will affect multiple different pathologies. But if all of these pathologies or many of these aging pathologies share growth, if they all require growth pathways to develop, then this genes that are involved in, in the coordination of growth of multiple tissues during development – 
are also going to be involved in the development of multiple pathologies in different tissues. So in the case of these large dogs, uh, where you've selected for growth, you, you, have, you have elevated levels of growth pathways, then you, you essentially accelerate the development of all of these senescent pathologies. So I, the, I, I think I'd put money on that dog project, really giving great results. The metformin one is much more risky, but we shall see. Interesting. What, and I think I've got a sense of what motivates you, but as you get up in the morning, as you come to work or in your laboratory right now, what gets you out of bed every day as it applies to the work that you do? I think it's a combination of two things that in a way you can't separate, which is the psychological need to do things, you know, like the need to be active, the need to do something purposeful, you know. So I guess uh, temperamentally I'm somebody who needs a a purpose, a, a proper purpose. Some people are lucky and they can simply enjoy their life and get up in the morning and feel happy that the sun's shining, you know. I'm not like that. I suppose fundamentally I see this work as a, in a way it's like a great gesture of love for for human beings because human beings are the things that is what matters most, you know. And uh, nothing could be more important than to look after people, you know. And at the moment it's the main cause of suffering and pain in the world is these diseases. As I say, yeah, I just watched both my parents die. They didn't die that badly as, as, as things go, but it was terrible, terrible. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's ultimately behind it all, the sense of enormous potential for good just to do like a sort of gift of love to, to humanity. And of course, intellectually, it's enormously rewarding. I mean, it's just, it's fantastic to work on a puzzle of, that's so grandiose and so, um, with so much future in it, you know. Yeah, it gets me out of bed. <laughs> and, in, and in terms of cracking ageing, of, of figuring it out, do you feel that you're on a cusp of something that is going to significantly move us forward with our understanding? Well, the first thing I would say there is that I, I think I've often felt as if the field must be on a cusp, you know, over the years. I mean, I've been doing this for more than 20 years. And there have been moments where it seems like everything's starting to come together. But then I think during the noughties, the, during, during that decade, that it was very odd. It was as if things seemed to get worse and worse. And I think it was really the, the, the waning of the damage maintenance paradigm in a sense of, you know, bizarre sense of that the, that the field just seemed to be getting worse you know although there's always plenty of genetics people keep publishing paper after paper after paper after paper about a new gene you know that's affecting lifespan right now i i feel very optimistic that we have we've essentially been able to uh, transcend a number of kind of folk theories and and fundamental errors about aging and in a broad brush way present a picture of what aging is in terms of late life gene late life action of wild type genes and the kind of mechanisms by which those work but um kind of having been here before i'm very conscious that i can only one can only be sure you know maybe in five ten years then one will know whether whether this is a sort of dawn of a understanding of aging or something else will take its place i mean i feel like we've just i feel as if the work that I'm doing and other folks here, it's as if it's sort of on track in terms of thinking about aging in the right way. To me, that's always been what I wanted, was to have a sense of, ah, okay, I think I basically get this now. I basically get what this is about. So it's a good time at the moment. It is a good time. David Gems, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, me too. Thank you very much indeed. If you'd like to comment on this interview or make suggestions for future episodes, you can contact us through our website, llamapodcast.com. You can follow us and leave messages on Facebook and Twitter at Llama Podcast. Thanks for listening.